Hey everyone, just a quick note before we get started today, I just wanted to update you all on the state of the channel. I'm still plugging away at the last several uh, corral harmonizations. There's about 20 of them left, if I'm not mistaken. And if you look at the BWV number today, uh, you might notice that it is quite a bit further back than the corrals that I've been analyzing recently, which have been in like the 400s. And uh, we're in the stage of the channel where we are going back and analyzing corrals that might have been missed due to me uh, misattributing the BWV number to the wrong text or the wrong harmonization because I wasn't using a good method of sourcing the corrals at the beginning of the channel. Um, but there are also some corrals that are much further along in the BWV numbers that were added later that weren't part of the big bulk of Bach's vocal works, which make up the majority of the early BWV numbers, you know, starting all the way at the beginning, working through the, um, the mid 400s. So I just wanted to start the video off with that little preface. Um, some of the BWV numbers are going to be a little disconnected from this point moving forward. You're not messing up. It's either partially because I messed up at the beginning of the channel or because that's just how the collection exists and that's what we're dealing with. So thank you again so much for watching the video and I hope you enjoy my analysis. Hey everyone, how's it going? Forrest here again with another installment of my complete analysis of all of J.S. Bach's chorale harmonizations. Today we're looking at Ach Gott von Himmel sie der Rhein, which translates to Ah oh God, look down from heaven. This is a super unusual chorale. It has some questionable harmonic inserts throughout. It is an average length chorale with a repeated A section and interesting stuff happening here in the hot spot. Also interesting stuff just spreckled throughout, but um, we'll talk about those instances as we get to them. We're just going to hop right into the analysis. So we have one flat in the key signature. We start with D major and we end with D major. I think at the beginning of the chorale this D major is just the dominant of G minor. So we're starting in G minor and the overall tonality of the chorale is a little bit ambiguous. I'm not 100% sure if I want to attribute it to G minor or if I want to attribute it to D minor because the ending here, uh, I've listened to it several times now and I can see someone making an argument for it being a half cadence in the key of G minor or being some type of authentic cadence in the key of D minor. I'm more on the side of it being an authentic cadence in the key of D minor now, but I think this is one of those ambiguous uh, cadences that we see that we can talk about when we get to it. So we're in the realm of G minor or D minor. D minor makes a little bit more sense with the key signature, but we know that Bach often uses one flat as the key signature for G minor chorales as well because E natural often makes an appearance due to it being a um, raised sixth scale degree. So we're just going to hop right into the analysis. The first phrase isn't too remarkable. It's in the key of G minor. We end with a half cadence. We start with our five chord, then we move to G, D, G, and B flat, which is our tonic triad and root position. We then have A, C, F sharp, and A, which is F sharp diminished over A, that's seven, six. And if you see a one chord going to a seven, six chord, you know that you're probably going to a one chord in first inversion on the next beat, B, D, G, and G. It's exactly what we get. This pattern's all over the place in Bach's chorale writing, one of the most common bread and butter progressions that we see Bach using in his chorale writing. We then get an accented non-chord tone here in the bass where we have G, G, B flat, and D, which is just taking our tonic triad and putting it in root position. No need to reiterate the Roman numeral. Then we get F sharp, D, A, and D, 
which is our five chord again, and this time in first inversion, that's D major, passing seventh in the melody, G, D, G, and B flat, tonic triad, root position, G minor, and then the phrase ends with our five chord, D, D, F sharp, and A, D major. Next phrase, we get our first interesting chord that happens right on the pickup to the first complete measure of the phrase. We have a perfect authentic cadence here at the end of the phrase, and we start off with A flat major, C, E flat, A flat, and C. I do think we're still in the key of G major, or sorry, G minor, and this is actually a Neapolitan chord especially because it's in first inversion which is often well that's what the textbook tells us that we often see it in first inversion and that might be true for other composers or just surveying the whole of the western canon um, but yes a neapolitan six chord that does in a roundabout fashion resolve to five which is pretty cool because other than this intermediary chord here, we pretty much have a direct relationship between A flat basically being a substitute for two um, going to five. So the intermediary uh, chord, sorry, that's always a word that's hard for me to say, intermediary, um, we have C sharp, E natural, G, and B flat, which is C sharp minor seven flat five. Oh no, sorry, C sharp fully diminished seventh in root position, which is seven, seven of five. I think here we haven't moved to the key of D, even though we're going to be seeing a series of tonicizations. I really do think that we're just getting a big dominant statement here, and it's just alternating between C sharp as a leading tone chord um, in between uh, D major. And we do have a uh, chromatic bass line here, and we know that with chromatic bass lines, there's usually something interesting afoot, but usually the passing tone is a secondary leading tone to the next chord, which happens to be the case here, D, D, F sharp, and A, five chords. So really, this C sharp chord here is just a passing chord, like I said, a chromatic passing chord, and um, it's really the Neapolitan six going to five. So it's really cool seeing this A flat, this like Phrygian second um, making an appearance in the chorales. We know that Bach definitely injects some modal, like some old world influence into his chorales for sure. It makes me wonder whether or not this particular melody or this particular text is associated with a melody that uses that Phrygian uh, second, and Bach was probably aware of it if that was the case. Passing seventh here in the tenor as well, before we get, like I mentioned earlier, another C sharp diminished chord, E, B flat, C sharp and G, which is just inverting the chord that we saw previously, seven, six, five of five, and then we get D major again, F sharp, A, D, and C. And really the main reason why I feel like we haven't modulated to the key of D or D minor is because of the fact that we see C naturals throughout the phrase. We see C sharp here and C sharp here, but we see C naturals happening in the other pair of voices, right? C sharps are making an appearance in the alto and the bass, but we don't see C sharp make an appearance in the melody or the tenor, which retains the um, dominant nature of the D chord. It's just a small clue. It wouldn't really need to be there. I mean, this could be a tone other than C uh, to give us that, um, that same sort of fulfillment. If it were a C sharp, that would be another story. Then we'd be thinking maybe um, that would be the case. We might have modulated to D minor, but no, I think that we're still in the realm of G major here, and this just happens to be 5, 6, 5, D7 over F sharp. Then we get G minor, G, G, D, and B flat, tonic triad and root position, and then we get our D major chord in root position again, D, F sharp, D, and A. Um, a is a chord tone, C is our chordal seventh here before we get G minor, G, B flat, D, and G, tonic triad, root position. Next phrase, we are still in the key of, oh, you know what? No, we've modulated the key of D minor by this point because we have C sharps pretty consistently throughout and um, we keep the B flat, but we don't have any E flats or ascending E F sharp or E F sharp G fragments to indicate to us that we're using melodic minor. So I'm pretty sure that we're in the key of D minor by this point. So this G minor chord 
uh, G, B flat, D, and G is still our tonic in the key of G minor, but it's also our subdominant in the key of D minor, four chord. And then we get uh, C sharp, A, E, and A, which is our dominant in first inversion in the key of D minor, A major over C sharp. And then we get what we would expect our uh, tonic triad in root position, D, A, D, and um, F natural. We then have a, A, C sharp, and E, which is our five chord, passing seventh in the bass, and then we get our tonic triad again in uh, first inversion, F, A, D, and D. It's almost as if this is a very briefly a five, four, two chord going on here, which is why it makes sense for this to go to a one, six chord. I think we have, these are passing tones in the outer voices here, which take us to D, A, D, and F, which is just our tonic triad, in root position and the reason why i'm reiterating the roman numeral instead of just including the figured base here is because it's a new line you could just write five three here the same way that i did here in the first uh, phrase of the chorale it doesn't make too much of a difference uh, for me if it's a new line even if it's redundant analysis i would reiterate the roman numeral but we have a passing seventh in the base we get b flat d d and g which is G minor in first inversion, 4, 6, and we already know that this is some type of half cadence, but it's a special type of half cadence that we've been keeping track of called the Phrygian half cadence that consists of the sixth of the minor scale, the natural sixth, that flatted uh, sixth here. In this case, it is B flat going down to A. And I've talked about at length in other videos that have more contrapuntally involved Phrygian half cadences, where sometimes it looks like a two chord, sometimes it looks like a six chord, sometimes it looks like a four chord, and usually I analyze it as a four six chord because in situations where the, there isn't counterpoint like this one, which um, kind of proves my point or at least strengthens my point, we have a four six chord going to a five chord. Whenever you lack that counterpoint between the pre-cadential chord and the final chord of the cadence, uh, it's going to be a 4-6 chord. Um, I'm like quickly indexing all of the chorales that have had Phrygian half cadences that I've analyzed recently, and there isn't anything to suggest that this has been anything other than a 4-6 chord, but if I go back far enough into the memory banks, there probably is a deviation from that like rule of thumb, but generally speaking, 4-6 going to 5 is your Phrygian half cadence that you're going to find in a Bach chorale at least. So 5 is our last chord. A, C sharp, E, and A. Next phrase is pretty interesting as well. We have this interesting movement in the bass here where we have E flat, then E natural, then E flat again. If you listen to the melody, it sounds like we're in the key of B flat here. Uh, F, G, A, B flat. And I think the juxtaposition of A major and uh, D minor here, it feels like the phrase is being resolved, right? It feels like A major is resolving to D minor. But as soon as we see that E flat, you know, that other uh, Neapolitan chord, I don't think it's introducing itself in the same context that we saw the flat two chord get introduced in the A section as. But after our resolution here, I do think we're pretty much going to the key of B flat major and D minor now becomes our three chord because three often goes to four. E flat's functioning more like a four here. And the chord progression, once you analyze it in the key of B flat, makes quite a bit of narrative sense as well. So passing seventh, E flat, G, B flat, and G. That's our four chord in root position, E flat major. Passing tones in the upper voices, which actually gives us E flat, G, C, and A which is A minor 7 flat 5 over E flat. That is 7, 4, 3. 4 going to 7 is probably the most common subdivided chord progression in all of the chorales. I'd have to go through and verify that, but my intuition tells me that that's the case because it's very common to see 4 go to um, 7 in this subdivided context. But afterwards, we would expect our tonic triad, and that's what we get B flat, sorry, D, F, D, and B flat tonic triad first inversion. And then there's room for debate here. I think we're still in the key of B flat major here, and we're just tonicizing the next chord over the end of the beat. But you could analyze this two beat fragment here in the key of F major if you wanted to as well. But if you look at these passing tones in the lower voices here, we get E, G, D, and B flat, which is E minor 7 flat 5 over, um, it's actually in root position, so I don't have to say over anything, over E. It's kind of redundant. 
a 7, 7 of 5, because E is the leading tone chord to F, and we would expect an E flat chord in the key of B flat, which is the big tell as to why we would expect, um, or why we know that this is a secondary dominant or some type of chromatic chord. And then we go to F, which the, we see the E flat happen immediately after the fact here. So F major, F, A, C, and A is operating as our 5, and even though it's not the most it's not the most elegant way of modulating. I think Bach puts us in a bit of a bind here, where from an analytical standpoint, we're seeing kind of an interesting chord progression here, and F is actually our pivot, because by the time we see A and um, moving down to this F sharp, I feel like this B flat augmented chord, which I'll talk about when we get to it, is um, we're already in the key of G minor. I don't think this B flat augmented chord is operating as a dominant. So five, is going to be, oh geez, I've run out of uh, room here. We'll just put the G minor there. And uh, it's operating as 7 here. That's what I think is going to happen. But um, as this uh, passing chord here as well, we've seen a lot of subdivisions happening here over the span of the ands of uh, the beats of this measure. That was so many extra words that I didn't need to say in that statement. Sorry, my brain was going elsewhere. But we have E flat, G, C, and A, which is A minor 7 flat 5 over E flat. So this would be 2, 4, 2, and 7 going to 2, 4, 2. You know, take it with a grain of salt. 7 going to 2 is a relatively uh, rare chord progression, just like 2 going to 7. It's the pair of chords that are a third apart that sees the least amount of um, least amount of uh, progression from one to the other, just because they're a third apart, but their functions are so different. And the only other pair of chords that really sees that same sort of relationship of difference of function but similar pitch content is maybe three and five. Uh, so seven going to two here. I think this is more of a coincidental chord, but uh, it is fully voiced and I didn't want to neglect it, but it is a 2-4-2 two, two chord and if that were the case it would resolve to 6, which in the key of G minor would be E flat major and we don't quite get that. We get D, F sharp, D, and B flat, which is B flat augmented over D, which is 3 plus 6. And I think the big picture here really is that if this 2-4-2 two, two chord is just coincidental, which I think it is, um, 7 going to 3 satisfies that cycle of falling fifths narrative and the chord on the end of the beat is always, it, well, I don't want to say always, but a lot of the times it is sort of uh, supplementary. It's not uh, explicitly adding to the complete narrative of the chord progression. There are subdivided chord progressions that do that. We see, you know, 4, 7, 1, 2, 5, 1. Um, with quite a bit of frequency, but progressions like this, they feel more incidental than anything else. Uh, but 2 often goes to 3, 7 often goes to 3, but 7 going to 2, like I said, it feels more coincidental than anything else. Anywho, after our 3 chord, our augmented 3 chord, we have a passing tone in the bass. We get B flat, G, D, and G, which is 1, 6, G minor in first inversion. We get a Non -chord a series of non-chord tones on the end of this beat. We have C, C, E flat, and G, which is like a passing four chord, C minor in root position. And as we get ready for our perfect authentic cadence, we get our five chord, D, A, D, and F sharp, D major. And then we get G minor, G, B flat, D, and G, tonic triad, root position. And then we get to our next phrase, which has more controversy, more room for debate, where the end could be either an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of D minor or a half cadence in the key of G minor. And I think there are arguments for both. I'm going to analyze it in the key of D minor for one core reason, which I'll talk about when I get there. But like I said, it can really be one or the other. It's difficult to say. It's just one of those androgynous uh, cadences, which is really cool that um, in very straightforward, uh, strict, um, common practice period harmony, there's room for argumentation like this. I think it's really cool when stuff like that pops up. 
But regardless, we start the phrase off with another G minor chord, no need to reanalyze. We get F sharp, A, D, and uh, D, which is our five chord and first inversion, D major over F sharp, and then we get G minor again, G, D, G, and B flat, passing seventh in the bass, E flat, G, E flat, and C, that's C minor over E flat, that's our four chord and first inversion, passing tone in the bass, and then we get uh, C, G, F and D. Yeah, that C is an accented non chord tone. It's really this B natural. It's more interesting, anyways. This leaves us with a G7 over B, which would be 565 of 4. You could analyze this uh, three beat fragment here in the key of C minor if you saw it that way. But for me, I feel like this is one of those instances where you have a. Uh, uh, a, uh, what is it called? A tonicization. Sorry, it's a term that I use all the time and it just escaped my memory for some reason. But 4 6 going to 5 6 5 of 5 going to presumably 4 C G E flat and C, which is our four chord. So, really, what I feel like is happening here is that we are getting some type of substitute for maybe like. Uh, five six, like uh, we're, we might be getting a substitute for like a D major. We might be getting some type of substitute for um, F sharp diminished. That's something that we would typically expect happening on the end of this beat. And if we look, we have F, which could be an F sharp. We have D, which is the root of the chord that we would expect. I mean, um, if this were an F sharp, we'd have an augmented second here in the alto, and we've been taught that that can exist. We have seen it um, rarely, but we have seen it. But yeah, augmented second, it would be uh, uh, atypical, especially over the span of two beats of the harmonic rhythm. But um, yeah, I think we're just seeing uh, a tonicized chord preceded by the chord that's going to be tonicized on the uh, the next beat of the harmonic rhythm. We've seen chords like this in the past, but this sort of straddles the line between modulation and tonicization. You could say that this little fragment here is in the key of C minor. You could say that we're in the key of G minor, but the melody really carries in the key of G minor, um, really through the end of the phrase, which makes the uh, cadence being interpreted in D minor that much more wonky. And uh, I'll talk about that when we get to it in just a little bit. So we get G minor next, G, G, D, and B flat. That's our tonic triad. And because I'm analyzing this in the key of D minor, I'm going to say that this is our pivot point, and D minor is now our four chord. And then we get A, G, C sharp, and A, which is an incomplete um, A7 chord. We can even reflect that in the figured bass. I know I don't always do that, but might as well here. It doesn't really matter. Um, I mean, it, 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 I guess, technically strengthens the analysis a little bit because the figure base is more, represent uh, more representative of what's actually happening on the beat. And here's the main reason why I feel like we're in the key of D minor here, or the core argument as to why D minor is the way to go when analyzing this. Here we get F natural and D. So even though we end on a D major chord, which in the key of G minor has meaning, we could be ending on the five, and Bach has ended plenty of chorales in a half cadence. Um, I think that F natural here in the tenor is uh, significant because while we are still in the middle of the phrase, we're nearing the end, but still in the middle of the phrase, we're getting a D minor chord that is resolved to by its own dominant and it's in first inversion. So 1, 6, 4, which presumably would go to 5, A, E, C sharp. We have a 4, 3 suspension over the bass. Very common to see that over dominant root position chords. And then A here in the melody, that's our 5 chord. We could have a bracket um, connecting the two of them too, if you learned how to analyze that way. That's how I learned how to analyze, so um, I include it just by habit. And then we cadence on what I'm believing to be our tonic, D, F sharp, D and A, which is a root position D major chord. And Bach often ends his minor chorales with major chords. So it's difficult to say what kind of cadence is going on here. It's almost like we're in two worlds at once. Like the melody really does feel like A wants to resolve down to G, which is the big proponent for why this is a half cadence. But this D minor chord here, and I had to check the uh, chorale as well when I'm looking at the 
digital version that I used to cross-reference that is in fact in F natural and having a minor dominant here before the end of the cadence in a 1, 6, 4, 5 situation, it's very difficult to um, deny the fact that that doesn't also have an effect on the um, harmonic interpretation of the end of this phrase. So whether you analyze it in G minor, whether you analyze it in D minor, there's room for debate there, and I think both sides are right. You can interpret it both ways. We'll never know because Bach never um, wrote about it, at least. I haven't read anything about it. I'd be fascinated to see if he did, but I, I, I'm skeptical that he ever did. But regardless, I think I'm going to cap the video off on those thoughts. Um, the big takeaways from this chorale are this little chromatic bass line here that consists of another takeaway, which is a Neapolitan chord. It's in first inversion, seeing that sort of Phrygian second chord going on in the key of G minor here. That's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, chromatic bass line going on here. Um, this idea of like the 4-2 resolution resolving in an irregular fashion, I didn't touch on this too much, but if this 2-4-2 chord is more than just an incidental passing chord, we would expect this to resolve to 6 in first inversion, right? Because, no, sorry, we would expect it to resolve to 5 in first inversion, which in the key of G minor would be... Oh, you know what? I totally made a mistake disregard what I just said. I'm going to leave this in the video to show you that I often make errors. I mean, if you've watched my videos, you know that I make errors and I catch them. This is not a two chord in third inversion. It's a two chord in second inversion. I'm trying to figure that out because this should resolve to an F if that were in third inversion, but no, it resolves to what would be the root of the um, D chord. And if that's the case, this is not an irregular 4-2 resolution at all because it's not a 4-2 chord. So disregard what I just said there. We have the chromatic bass line, we have the Neapolitan 6 chord, and the fact that it does not end in a perfect authentic cadence. I think that is worth um, taking away as well. And the, the, there's an ambiguous tonality going on here as well, which uh, leaves room up for debate. It's always fascinating when that's the case. So um, Yes, I think that's all that I want to talk about in this particular video. Very fascinating harmony. I'm going to cap the video off on those thoughts. If you're interested in following me along on the journey to analyze all of Bach's chorale harmonizations, feel free to subscribe to the channel. You can hit the notification icon and like the video as well if you enjoyed the content. Thank you so much for watching the video and supporting the channel by doing so. I look forward to tomorrow's analysis, and I hope you take care.